I cannot hear a thing. Are we on the air? We are on the air. Okay. I'm getting nothing out of these speakers. Anyways, I'm assuming people are applauding right now. I guess maybe or maybe not. Anyways, thanks for joining us here tonight. Which camera am I on? This one? All right. We're, we're going to be, yeah, we're going to be breaking some eggs, scrambling them up, <laughs> and squeezing some lemons and making lemonade out of them because uh, we're kind of getting by with a crew is, that has never worked together and some have not done the show. But no excuses, folks. This is show business, and Planet Valenti Television is with you right now. PVTV is on the air, and I hope at some point I can get some monitors uh, out here so I can hear what's going on in the show. Yeah, there they are. I think there's some people in here. All right. And I've got uh, some TV magic going on in the background. Third Thursday is tonight, so lots of folks probably out there enjoying the good weather. And, you know, and that's a great thing, Third Thursday. But I'll tell you what, Planet Valenti Television does First Thursday, Second Thursday, third Thursday, fourth Thursday, and sometimes fifth Thursday. We're reliable. We're, we're here every night for you, and we, we thank you for your applause. If you could boost that uh, sound monitor a little bit, uh, that would help me out as well. And we're going to come and present some information tonight, share a few things to kind of inform you as we try to do both on planetvalenti.com and the... Planet Valenti <coughs> Television, PVTV, to basically arm you. And, and we're going to have a guest tonight. We've had one guest. This is our seventh show, episode seven. And I've done something I've always wanted to do, which is be able to truthfully say I bettered Orson Welles, the great genius director, director of the greatest film of all time, Citizen Kane. And with the seventh show, I have exceeded the number of episodes that Wells did for the BBC. He had this great little show. It was a 15-minute show, and it was called Orson Welles' Sketchbook. And he would come out. He was an artist among many other talents that he had. And he would do a little sketch, and then being the great tour that he is, would basically schmooze for 15 minutes in that great voice. I wish I knew where he, I'm going to come over here and get some uh, liquid refreshment. <laughs> it's iced tea, I swear. Mm, how sweet it is. <laughs> yeah. Wells came on and did this where did he get those pipes? That he, he did voiceovers for a lot of films, and that was the voice you wanted. The show lasted six episodes. The BBC decided that it wasn't interesting enough, and that show is now on YouTube. And if you want to check that out, just Google YouTube Orson Welles Sketchbook, and it just shows you how stupid television executives are. <laughs> Except for PCTV, of course. <laughs> So we're going to have a little bit of fun tonight with our guest, only the second guest in seven episodes. I'm not sure we should count the Generalissimo, but uh, I guess we will. So that would be the third guest. And this third guest is one of the great names in Pittsfield's, I'd say, recent history. It's modern history name that many will recognize from his sports prowess and also later on for his political involvement. And we're going to talk sports and politics with our guests. I'll keep you wondering as to who that might be, and you'll find out uh, in a little bit here. We've got some housekeeping to take care of, though. Just some points I wanted to bring up. I love it. That's why the Generalissimo allowed me to live another week and do the show. He told me, he like you, you do a good job. 
and I am not the generalissimo. That's a vile rumor being spread by the mayor's office. <laughs> we, you saw the segment last week, and we went unannounced into City Hall. I think it was last week. We got uh, a little film crew together consisting of a cameraman and the generalissimo, and I was on hand also to provide uh, the script. And people were saying, yeah, it was funny, but y you told City Hall you were coming in advance. And the fact of the matter is that was not true. We walked in cold, literally kind of an updated candid camera to see what would happen. So we go into the city clerk's office and the best functioning office, by the way, in, in the city and one of the few departments that you can say that taxpayers are really getting a bang for their buck. We go in there and they played along nicely. We had some fun with that and some of the visitors. Okay, heads are poking in and out of offices. And uh, I heard from a city hall worker later that, you know, the, f the uh, either how they do it, texting or get on the telephone, yeah, something's going on. I, I, they said Valenti's in the building. It was the Generalissimo. I never set foot in City Hall. <laughs> so we had another segment that we showed last week for the first time where we wandered around the corner to the mayor's office. And the Generalissimo was actually proof. You know, seeing is believing most of the time, <laughs> especially on this show. Otherwise, you can't believe a thing in this city. We, we have the Generalissimo in front of the mayor's door. Now, the mayor is in his office because we were told that. His car is in the parking lot, and he had to have been informed. I don't know this from a fact because he did not confirm that with me. But we were told he knew we were in the building, and we wanted to see what would happen if he would dare come out. He's got a standing invitation to come on this show live in the flesh rather than in the fabric anytime he wishes. And we were out there kind of doing our shtick. They want him. They really want him to be on this show, and it's his choice. We were hoping that he would come out and I don't know, confront the Generalissimo, congratulate him for the coup, as the Generalissimo Mo pronounces it, his takeover of government. <laughs> Didn't show up. Another no-show. And I had this image, and again, I, I didn't see him. I don't have x-ray vision. I don't have my x-ray specs on. Remember those in the back of comic books? You have those little swirly whirlpools for lenses and they would show this picture of a guy whose tongue was hanging out and dripping and he would be looking at a woman and you could s see her silhouette under the dress <laughs> i had a friend of mine who who sucked for it and wasted wasted a dollar 98 cents on x-ray specs and basically all it did was it gave you gave you double vision you couldn't see through walls and I don't have my supervision with me right now. Get it? Supervision, right? Terrible. We wanted, we wanted the empty suit in the flesh. Daniel M. B. I. A. N. K. I. Bianchi to come out and have uh, some interaction with the Generalissimo. I envisioned him now in my mind hiding under the desk, kind of kind of like, you know, this. He must have been, maybe he was thinking he was practicing one of those air raid drills that we had in the 50s. Duck and cover, I could see the mayor doing this. I don't know that he did that. I did see the duck and cover turtle, though, walking the corridors at City Hall. 
So he will choose his own Johnny Walker blue, which is which is the top grade. You know Johnny Walker red, black, double black, gold, platinum, and they make a brand called Johnny Walker Blue. Only one in 10,000 cases at Johnny Walker gets selected for blue. And he, uh, I forgot where I was going with that. Uh, <laughs> be that as it may, and all seriousness aside, as Steve Allen said, he had his chance. And in fact, I'll issue an open invitation to any member of the city government, department heads, anybody who wants to come on the show, and particularly anyone who will come on the show and defend the horrible job that the mayor has done with his budget proposal. $100 million plus for the school department. They'll tell you it's $56 million because they leave about Forty two, forty four, forty five million off the school department side of the ledger and shove it and bury it in the city side. They don't present an honest discussion of that. Your taxes are going to go up. And I want to share just one thing. And then we're going to introduce our, our guest here. But it, you know that this budget is probably going to pass untouched out of a hundred and forty eight million dollars or whatever it is they will find scant places to cut the budget I know your income is probably going down maybe you haven't had a raise for a while if you're on a fixed income as many senior citizens are you can't afford any kind of a pay a raise in tribute that you send to Caesar and his government. You are rendering to Caesar already vast amounts of money for shrinking services. Now, the taxes, depending on what they do, will probably go up four and a half to five and a half percent. Let's just let's just use five percent as a figure. You'll recall if you've read uh, the Planet Valenti dot com. And on this show, we went through budget information on, on uh, the dot-com side of things. We went through the last 30 municipal budgets. And in all but two of those, 28 out of the last 30 municipal or fiscal years, the city has raised your taxes. The gravy train, right? <laughs> Works out for some people. He's unbelievable. He's unbelievable. I, oh, wait. <clears throat> that was not me that was doing the job. You have the triple, what I call the triple whammy. Okay, your taxes are going to go up 5%. There's the first whammy. The second whammy is going to come next year when they reassess property values in town. And it, that has a funny way of working in the city. They, it seems like certain properties of favored people, people who know somebody, people who are politically corrected, their assessments really don't go up. The little guys, the, the guy who's uh, trying to still pay off a mortgage in a $115,000 duplex, he's going to get whammed again next year. We're making the prediction now. Don't have a crystal ball, but I've studied history. And if they follow suit again, the assessments on people who can least afford it will go up. Is that good enough? I don't know. Why not get involved? Why not shake off your apathy and channel your anger and channel that? So that's the double whammy. Taxes go up 5%. Assessments will go up. Valuation on 1000 $115,000 home, you've done nothing to it, all of a sudden is worth 120000 
The third whammy is the fact that tax increases, just like interest in the bank, compounds yearly. So think about this. If you're going up four and a half, five, five and a half percent year after year, that's compounding. I did 10 years to show you how this works. And the longer you go, the, the higher the gains are. You start off in the first year with a 5% raise. Next year is 5% of the new amount. You're up to five and a quarter. That's the first year of increase off of the first amount. Second year is 5.5%. Thir uh, third year, 58 In the fourth year, that 5% increase is actually a 6% increase. And you go through all of that until the 10th year of that sequence. 5% is between 8 and 9% because it's compounded every year. There's your triple whammy. Folks can't afford that. But here's what they can't afford. To hear from one of the great sports and political legends that has come out of the city of Pittsfield, I'd say going back to post the post-war era in any case. The guy I'm about to introduce, I'll, I'll give you a little hint here. <clears throat> Got a baseball bat. <laughs> Got a glove and ball. He made his name locally as a ball player and was good enough to be signed by the San Francisco Giants and toiled in their farm system for a few years and also played big time football at Colgate. And then after that, found a life for himself in Pittsfield as an entrepreneur in real estate and also in politics. Served on the school committee, served on the city council, served on the parks commission, has been involved in public life for all of those years since the 70s. Uh, actually was a key figure in Mike Dukakis's campaign when Duke was running for governor. You never know it, he's a great guy and down to earth as you could uh, possibly want. And Chuck's gonna talk about some sports and politics. We gave it away. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for the one and only Chuck Garavaltis. There's your there's your talking stick, Chuck. And uh, if you if you just have a seat, we can uh, why don't you flop over this way. And Chuck, uh, we, we gave you that introduction, and I will still say the, the finest pure hitter, and we'll get an argument on this. It's like, who was the greatest pitcher of all time, greatest hitter, Ted Williams, Ty Cobb. I still say you were the greatest pure hitter that came out of uh, Pittsfield, uh, certainly schoolboy sports, but just in, in terms of a bat coming out of here. And we had some good ones. Tommy Grieve comes to mind. Yeah, Tommy Grieve. And just put the just talk right into the mic directly there, Chuck. Yeah, certainly, Tommy Grieve went on to the major leagues. How about Mark Bellinger, who was a pretty pretty fair hitter, but a a, a great fielder. Uh, Pittsfield has a long line and a great history of. And I'm just players. gonna just correct you with the mic. Just okay. talk into it like that. Okay. okay. Uh, Pittsfield was a baseball hotbed at uh, it, during those years in the 40s and 50s. Uh, you you just named some of the. Uh, great ball players. Art Dittmar was another one. It, it was the golden years of Pittsfield baseball. Uh, you're right, going back into the 40s and 50s. An example of that, in 1949, Pittsfield High won the um, Massachusetts State Baseball Championship, and their summer baseball club, the Brass Rail, uh, went on to Johnstown, Pennsylvania, where they won the All-American Amateur Baseball Tournament Championship. That was in 49. And then that was followed up in 51 and then 52, where a new set of players, but representing Pittsfield, Massachusetts, uh, were undefeated 
two years in a row in baseball, in Berkshire County ball, winning 42 games. And unfortunately, lost a couple in the uh, playoffs down there in Holyoke. So the record was 42 and 2. Not too oh, bad. Not, not, not too shabby. And, uh, but our summertime leagues were, were extraordinary. How did, the, how did the scouts learn of Chuck Garavaltis? Uh, as we said, you eventually signed with the uh, New York, and then they became the San Francisco Giants. But you were scouted by the Phillies, the Indians. You've got a great story about that. Uh, how did they first learn uh, that you were kind of tearing up the leagues uh, back here? Pittsfield was uh, was on the list as a great baseball town. They and, were and the Bird Dogs and Scouts. Oh, the Bird Dogs were here for um, many many years, watching uh, many many ball players. You you had mentioned Art Dittmar uh, around the Arts period of time. There was also uh, Donnie Troy. And then coming up into uh, my area, there was Itch McMahon, Tony Ford, and Larry Bossidy, yep, Larry. Dick Diorio. I mean, there were some great players up in the, through there. We could go Gene Hermansky. Well, and if Gene you, Hermansky played with the Brooklyn Dodgers, yes, and he, he was did. a Pittsfield boy. And I think he was on that 55 team that won it all, wasn't he? He was, that's right. I yeah. believe he was the left fielder. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, he was. And mm -hmm. Mark Belanger also won a, oh, Mark. a, a title with uh, uh, the Baltimore uh, Orioles. A couple of World Series Mark was in, uh, and he was also the, uh, the shortstop for that great Pittsfield American Legion team that went on to the American Legion World Series in Hastings, Nebraska. The 1960 team. 60 team. Was it yeah. 60? I forgot yeah, the I think year, it was 60. but I think it was 60. But you mentioned Larry there. Bossidy, and, of course, we, we all know about mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Bossidy. And he will always be Mr. to me. Uh, he, he went on to great success in the dreaded private sector, CEO of Honeywell and uh, vice president of GE, then moved on to CEO of Honeywell. And, and uh, a business, I guess, Puba, uh, along the ranks of Jack Welch, you have an intimate connection with Larry Bossidy because you and Larry played on the same uh, team in high school and then went on to Colgate and you were telling me earlier today that before he hurt his arm, Larry was a major league caliber pitcher. He was offered a major league contract when he graduated from Pittsfield High School, offered $40,000 by the Detroit Tigers, refused it because uh, his mother insisted that he go on to college and, uh, and get a college education. Uh, How do you think that worked out for it Larry? <laughs> it, worked he, out, it worked out pretty well for him. He, he would have been <laughs> signed by the, the uh, Tigers uh, whoever you got him, and probably been making, you know, when he first came up, maybe uh, seven, eight thousand a year. Uh -huh. Went into business and did okay for himself. And then didn't do, didn't do too badly for himself. Did very well, and it's probably a good thing for Pittsfield that he didn't sign at that time. Because if he had signed with the Detroit Tigers and gone on to the major leagues, he may never have been in a position to have uh, contributed one million dollars to the city of Pittsfield for the improvement and preservation of uh, Pittsfield's playing fields. When we switch over to politics, Chuck, w remind me to bring that up uh, or bring it up yourself. I'll be glad to. What happened with that money is still one of the municipal disgraces that to this day haunts this town by the work that was not done with the money and the unnecessary and wasteful expense of the money. I, I will wait until we get over. To well, the we'll wait till we get over. But I want to I just point out that, quickly that you and, and Larry continued on and became teammates at Colgate both in baseball and back then, Colgate had big time football. Uh, we and, had and we, we had we had pretty pretty good big time baseball too because yeah. there was one year over there, our sophomore year, where we won the Eastern Seaboard and went on to play in the uh, College World Series in Hastings in um, which I think is Omaha, going Nebraska, on right now. going on right now at the present uh, present time, and that was the one and only time in Colgate's history that they went on to the World Series. Larry pitched the opening game against Wake Forest. Lost it one to nothing. It was a heartbreaker. He pitched a three hitter, and Wake oh. Forest went on to win the championship. Wow! So they a won a break or two. A you break guys or two. Break or there. two. We could have won it all. And you guys so, also beat a a national powerhouse. That uh, when you told me about this today, I said it was the Southern Cal. Yeah, it was the Southern Cal, the Trojans, uh, and uh, the, at, the vaunted at, Trojans. Oh, the vaunted Trojans. And at that time, Colgate had thirteen hundred students. Southern wow. Cal had 30,000 yeah. students. Yeah. We played them in the College World Series, and we beat them. And once again, Larry came in for relief on that game, 
uh, stopped a rally that Southern Cal had underway and, uh, and went on to, uh, Colgate went on to, to win that game. With a break or two, we could have won the World Series. We could have gone all the way. And, of course, today now, that, that's almost big-time sports. It, the games are on ESPN, and these ballplayers uh, get television exposure and different level of exposure than it was in your day. But I, w I wanted to just move you along, Chuck. You, you got signed by the Giants, and you were two years in their system, and you rose as, uh, rose as high as, as double A? It was, a, it was yeah. A at the time. A at the time, that, in Springfield. In Springfield, and that was when there was D, B, C, yeah. A, double A, triple A, and then the major yeah. leagues, right? That so, was when there so was a, a back far, then far was probably like – it would double be double A, a or even, 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 even triple, triple A, a today. today. That, that is yeah. correct. Because and you played with a couple of names that some of our f longtime baseball fans might remember. Felipe Alou Felipe, Felipe and Alou was Jose the Pagan. Fielder, and Jose Pagan was the second baseman. And both those guys were key to the year the Giants won the pennant in 62. They were. Not, not much removed from when you were playing in the late 50s. Very, very close in terms of time period. And the very next year, uh, the very next year that I played with Felipe Alou, uh, he was brought up to the Giants and uh, played right field for the Giants. He wasn't about to move the center fielder uh, out of that position because it was Willie Mays. Oh, so well, Willie I can't <laughs> understand that. What I, were they thinking? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Willie was the center fielder. And, and he, Philippe was the right fielder. And Alou played with his two brothers. And then the brothers came Jesus along a few years Maddie. later. That's right. Yeah. They came along a of few course, years people later. People don't remember there were five Alou brothers. There was Philippe, Matty, Jesus. There was Boogaloo. He, he's uh, a Boogaloo? I didn't, Boogaloo, I didn't yeah. know Boogaloo. He was, related to bo uh, uh, <laughs> he, he was related to Boog Powell. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he was a pretty good hitter playing with Mark Bellinger. Yes, he yeah, was. Right. And, uh, and there was Louie Alou. Louie Alou. All right. Okay. I should have stopped at Boog. <laughs> but it, it didn't work out for you in uh, no, pro ball, Chuck. No, it didn't. Well, you, you tell this great story about when, when you're uh, in, in spring training, I guess, and you saw you were uh, an outfielder, and you're next to Felipe Alou in the outfield. Pick it up from there. Oh my, you re you, re you remember that story <laughs> yes, exactly? Yes, I do. So they 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 th this was my actually my first day in professional baseball, and they said, okay, go out to uh, center field. We're going to hit you some ground balls and fly balls, and we'll see if you can catch them and, and how good your arm is and the like. So sure enough, I went out and I picked them up and. Mm, Caught the ball and then uh, tr fired it in with uh, with some effort to, to home plate and, and, and thought I did thought, thought I did pretty well. Thought you were Rocky Colavito. Oh yeah, or, well, yeah. Or Dwight Evans. <laughs> Maybe Dwight Evans, right? Because Rocky had a gun for an arm. Yes, he did. So you're you're feeling yeah. pretty good about oh, yourself. I'm feeling pretty good. And then they <laughs> then the very the very next one they hit they hit the Philippe and he very effortlessly picked it up. And just threw it hardly w w without effort, and it was absolute an absolute frozen rope. From uh, it must have been I uh, maybe 325 feet out in center field, right in right into the catcher, and I was absolutely stunned when I saw that, and I said, "What in the world am I up against here?" Welcome to pro ball. Welcome to pro ball, you and that was Philippe Alou. You didn't see that kind of stuff at Colgate or no, playing at Pittsfield. Not, not at all, and we thought yeah. we played a pretty good uh, caliber ball at Colgate too. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. Uh, other and than the terrible springs that uh, were actually well, worse you know, than they are here the in the city thing. of Pittsfield. We, we talked about this city at one time no longer true, a baseball hotbed. We were on the A-list of the scouts, as you just said. We didn't have the weather that Florida has, that California has. And the, the miserable springs, you guys didn't get the reps, the at-bats, you, you made do. And it's incredible with all of that, the talent that came out. The ta uh, the, that what was accomplished here in the city of Pittsfield but because of the West spring weather that we get here, get here was absolutely uh, almost beyond, beyond belief. You know, because you often you'd be out there when there was snowing out playing. Yeah. I remember I played a ton of sandlot ball and oh. played Little League Babe Ruth. And, and you remember the, the era you guys played uh, – the Crescent Creamery field. Crescent Creamery parking lot. lot that, that's right. But I remember going to Deming Park, and at the time they had four official diamonds. They had the Babe Ruth diamond, the Little League diamond, the softball diamond, and then kind of like the practice diamond. There were four fields, and then there was a makeshift field. And I remember days when all, all of, five all were, all were full. fields yeah, kids had were game. Playing. No adults around. Mm -hmm. J just, you know, the park director and Mr. Leslie 
at, at Deming, who was the park officer, and kids ha having fun and playing ball all day, which is what we did. And baseball, uh, as you know better than, than anyone, is, is a game that requires the, the reps. You got to put in the hours. You got to put in the hours, and that's why we, uh, that's why we were on the, uh, the the list of scouts to come and, and yeah. watch these Pittsfield teams play. Because during that period of time, that's what youngsters did. They went to the park and they played ball from morning, to afternoon, and uh, and again in the evening. And the city somehow managed to not just support that in a token way, but actually provided a vast array of services and programs for the young people yeah. and you know we go by a park today Wh what are the chances Chuck if if you went by Osceola or Pitt or, or Curvin or, or Deming clap anyone to find a pick a Sandlot game you wouldn't see it you don't you see don't it? see it today that's right you just don't see it today but y years ago any place there was some open land and didn't have to be a park, you found kids were re, uh, uh, passing and, and playing and hitting the ball and, uh, you know, having, having a pickup game. No umpires, no adults. And, they, and you got into disputes as invariably it happens with kids. And you didn't wait for the adult to come in and, and settle it for you. <laughs> Settled with fists. And, and that, that if, is correct. If the right one don't get you, <laughs> the left, left one will. The left one will. And then, and then you went on to play the game, and you all went home together. And even you, the fellow you fought with. And you, and you, that's right, you were best friends after. That's after happened that. to me with a couple of guys. You got in fights with, and, and you become best friends. Uh -huh. And you'd come home, and your, your mom wouldn't say, oh, you got scraped up. You were in a fight. I'm going to go and uh, sue the city. I'm going to go, who did this? I'm going to speak to Johnny's parents, right? What did your mom do? Wash, wash your face and say, sit down and eat now. <laughs> and that's right. That's it. <laughs> that was it. That was it. Um, you, Dan, you, you had mentioned that, and I had mentioned the Crescent Creamy parking lot. For those people that know it on Merriam Street, uh, uh, now it's all tarred over. But at that time, there were some, it was a kind of rolling hills, and it was grass, and it was rocks, and the like, and we made a ball field out of it, and uh, Mr. O'Brien let, let us play there uh, every day during can, the summer. Can you imagine today the liability concerns? A kid is playing sandlot ball on a less than perfect field and uh, twists an ankle, breaks a leg, gets... You know, or hit in the head. Even scrapes a knee nowadays. Scrapes, that, that's uh, right. He'd yeah. be running to a lawyer. He'd be running to a lawyer, and the parents would be right behind him it's, instead of Encur boxing the kids' Encur ears. Encouraging it. That's right. Encouraging yeah, that's it. That's right. Some parents would teach their kids baseball uh -huh. so they could go to the sandlot and get hurt. <laughs> so they yeah, could have a lawsuit. Uh, it's, yeah, a different, it's a different time and a different era. We all understand that, but... In my humble opinion, and Larry Bossidy also believed this with his gift of a million bucks, the parks system and recreation and sports and getting out there moving around instead of standing in front of a screen all day is, is so important to young people and worth supporting. Worth supporting as, as much as a city could, and in his case, uh, private dollars. And uh, you know what? That's a good lead-in now. I did want to show you, though, folks, we've got Chuck played Colga uh, football at Colgate, and that was back in the days when Syracuse, one of my alma maters, got to give that a plug, had some great ball players, legendary coach Ben Schw Schwartzwaller, right. and probably the greatest player in NFL history, the great Jim Brown, the fullback for the Orange, number 44, and Chuck Every year, you were telling me you guys played Syracuse out there at Archbold, the big stadium, and you ran up against Jim Brown. You played defensive back. We, we played both ways. We had to play offense and defense. What did you do time. on offense? Halfback. Wow. Yeah, I could run. One of the two-way guys. Yeah, you had speed. Yeah, yep. I had speed. I could, I could run. So I played halfback. I was first strength three years in a row. And you guys uh, uh, actually and, beat and Syracuse as freshmen. <laughs> In our freshman year, we beat the Syracuse freshman team, and Jim Brown was on that freshman team. And played played uh, them three years subsequent to that, and uh, uh, one of them was a two-point game. One of, we almost beat them my junior year. It was 21-19. But I want to get to this photograph that I asked you to bring in. 
And if you know anything about Jim Brown, he was the prototype uh, probably 30 years ahead of his time. He was 6'2", 205, had the physique of an Adonis, had blinding speed, and for a running back in the NFL, he was a giant. And you could not stop him. You had to gang tackle Brown. Chuck, you're getting beat by Colgate. Brown has the ball. He's sweeping around uh, the right side. The right side. That's, that's you go right. up to make the play. You throw off a tackle. What happens? I, I throw off a tackle, and Brown's coming down. Now, as, as Dan had mentioned, he was 6'2", 225 pounds. 20 uh, more pounds than uh, I thought. Y- yes, and, and, he, and he was fat, and fast, fast, fat, very fast, faster than most halfbacks. And he had, and he had the, the, the coordination and balance of, uh, of a gymnast, just a superb athlete. And he's coming around in the corner. I, th- I throw off a, a, a uh, prospective blocker, and Jim Brown is then now only about seven yards from me. And so there's Jim Brown and I alone, <laughs> and he's coming right at me. And everyone who looks at the picture, including my own children when they first saw it, I'll say, Dad, did you get him? <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, that's the first thing I asked you when and I saw that's it. That's the first thing you asked, too. And the answer to that is, yes, yes. I did. Chuck, I'm going to hold up the photograph now. And, uh, Tyler, if we could get a – oh, the wrong one here. If we can get a close-up of this photograph here. And zoom on in on that. I'll try to get it rid of the shine. Coming through pretty good. Dan, if there's anyone out there that's not quite familiar with Jim Brown because of a, of a, of a, a, a generational uh, gap here, uh, uh, Jim Brown, uh, uh, I think, uh, is the Babe Ruth of is the Babe Ruth of football. Uh, he was he was he was that great, and his performance over the years was that outstanding. Give me some of your mic there, Chuck. I just want to because I want to uh, take the take the viewers through this. Here's Brown. He's, uh, as you can see, he's he's running around number 44. He's running around right end. Here is the great Chuck Garavaltis, and you can see where he's throwing this block off. He's he's sweeping this guy aside, and and Brown, uh, Chuck, if the 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 uh, interference for Brown, whoever that guy is, probably a tackler or a guard, had had got himself in better position, he's wide open to go all the way. Yes, he is. He would have gone 70 yards. <laughs> and there so for, you, for another touchdown. Another touch. He yeah. scored six that day. Yes, he did against us. That was their Cotton Bowl team. That was their Cotton Bowl, Cotton team, Bowl team where they, they lost a heartbreak. Yep. Yeah, they lost a heartbreak at they, the Texas Christian. And they won. And in 59, they won with Ernie Davis at fullback. That's right. The national title. And Brown so went on to the pros where he was all pro every year. Every year and just set records that will never be touched considering they played 12 games and 14 games. And, and he did not believe in stepping out of bounds. He wanted to take the hit. And here's another interesting factor on that, and, and, and that is nine years professional football. He did not miss a minute due to injury. Unbelievable. Sucked it up. Chuck, That's we're so going to segue now. Do we have the uh, theme music? Because we're going to talk politics right now, and you've been around the Pittsfield scene for a while. And let's get uh, – we're going to be joined by the empty seat, I think. Uh, we're going to have him out here. Do we have his theme music? Let's do a twosome here. We've we got to wait till they find it there. They, okay, is it, is it going? Because we want to show all due respect to his fabric. My wife is going to say, you haven't danced with me for uh, six months, but you're going to be out dancing with Dan Valenti. <laughs> if you want to do a twosome. Let's right. not, that's, this is Massachusetts, right. yeah, Chuck. Right. Let's, not, that's right. let's not start anything here. I got enough problems. Right. Hey, okay, it's going to, we're going to show some patience here. But if you can stop Jim Brown in the open field and bring him down, you can deal with this. No problem. I'm still I, waiting for the music. I think so. Okay. Okay, we can't hear it, but it's going. And can we? Yeah. All right. 
Bring them out. Just have to imagine. We will. I, we hope the viewers are listening. And Chuck, if you could take a seat over there. Okay. And uh, your highness, your honor, your whatever you are, you're welcome to the show. You uh, will get you up here. I noticed that uh, the empty suit test, T-E-S, is, why don't we cut to, yeah, cut to a four camera, is uh, coatless today. So he must have been doing some hard work for this. So. A hot summer day. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> maybe cutting a ribbon, maybe issuing a proclamation for Arbor Day yes. <laughs> to right. enhance the tree population. Uh, yeah, and I... And, and, and uh, talk talk you into your mic there, Chuck. <laughs> Enhancing the tree population. What, Dan, did you know many saps along that line? Yes, yeah, I right. did, okay. as a matter of fact. I've gone out on the limb many times. <laughs> And including today's column on PlanetValenti.com, we, we talked about this the city yeah. issuing Dan, Dan, a. Is this a, 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 a drink for me? This here? is a drink right here. Maybe, uh, That's a pure gin. Cold, okay. uh, cold gin. Cold, cold beer would have been you. very, very nice. But okay. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll accept this. Though. Salud. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, Chuck, we talked about the Bossidy Bucks. And Larry Bossidy made a gift of $1 million, and he did not couch how he wanted it spent. It was very simple, expository, declarative prose. He wanted the money to be used to improve the parks and playing fields of the city. It did not happen. That money was basically pissed away and wasted. Now, I'm of the opinion, and you've known Larry uh, all, all of your life, that had we wisely used that money, and there would have been more coming because Larry knows every big shot that you want to know. And if, if he had gotten behind this, who knows what would have happened. V very likely, Dan. Who knows what would have happened. Not only that, but he still loves Pittsfield. I mean, he, he still feels an attraction to Pittsfield. He married a Pittsfield girl, Nancy Jo Rothaus. Some of the Rodhouse family still lives here. His father owned a, ju a shoe store in Pittsfield, and and he's still uh, uh, active in, uh, in 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 the business circles in Pittsfield as a as a director on uh, on Berkshire Bank. So and so he would love to see Pittsfield thrive and cure uh, and move and, forward. and put his money where his mouth was, and and the city basically just said thanks but no thanks. Well, essentially, he sure put his money where his mouth was. And he contributed he contributed a million dollars with, with with the instructions, just the instructions, for the improvement and preservation of playing fields. Yeah. Now here, here's it's not difficult to interpret. Oh, 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 the fun in that one. Yeah. Did what you, did he mean by did you, playing did, fields? Did you know? that two letters were sent by a couple of different boards I did asking, know what do you mean? I did know that Mr. because Russell. I broke those stories on my radio, on radio show. show. <laughs> and read the letters and we got into this discussion. We would read what Larry uh, Bossidy said very clearly and they had to send back for clarification what, what and ended up what? spending the money on anything. Oh, they did the great improvement of Clapp Park. How did that work out, Chuck? Oh, it was a complete sham, in my opinion. Yeah. All one has to do is walk down there now and take a look at the track, right? The track, which, which was a very nice quarter-mile track. Yes, it was. Now it's a... A, a, a third a, of a mile. A, a third of a mile, and it goes up around up, up around the, uh, the, the baseball uh, yep. uh, batting area yep. where if there's a game on yep. and somebody batting, it would be very disturbing. For, the forget whole thing about was, this. was, was yeah. totally ridiculous. And yep. they installed a sprinkler system. Chuck, you played a ton of ball there. D have you ever seen a, a brown blade of grass in the common all those years where there was no sprinkler system? I, I was going down to Clapp Park when I was six years of age. So I've been going on Clapp Park for most of my life. Never saw and brown I grass. I've never about. seen brown grass yeah. at Clapp Park. And I brought that Unless up before the money was spent. Before the money was spent. Saying this, we don't need a sprinkler system at Clapp Park. You were we on the Parks it. Commission after they approved after it. After they approved them, and I tried to stop it. And it didn't work it, out. It did not what work about out. Uh, the present mayor, Chuck? We, I think anybody who is objective and, and stands apart would come in and say, 
the city is hurting. Is it a question of leadership? Uh, well, well, I think it's, it's, it's always leadership yeah. because it, you know, it, it, it comes from the top. Uh, and if you, you have the, the, the right leadership or per perhaps those people that are below you, whether on the, on the city council or as, uh, in, uh, as representatives, uh, you, you can get them to, uh, uh, to follow you. Um, and and uh, get people to follow you if you present a clear and articulate vision of where you want to take the city. Well, and I, I think there's still hope in the city of Pittsfield for that. I mean, if, if we Everyone's hoping. Around. We have been hoping now since 2000, the 2011 election that at some point the mayor would have stepped forward and presented himself as that type of leader. It has not happened. I don't see it happening based on how political that office has become. I, I, I had high hopes, and I think a lot of us did. Well, I did, too. I endorsed uh, the guy. Yeah, and, uh, and, and he certainly, uh, he, he certainly uh, uh, I think, did a, did a fine job uh, as uh, Mayor Wachowski's city treasurer uh, when the city of Pittsfield was put in receivership. She to, was one of the no. people who... We said out of 30 budgets, there were only two that went down, and 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 she had one of them. Sarah Hathaway had the other one. Interesting, the two female mayors uh, realized that you had to at least try to control. I remember Ann did that, but you know we're well he apparently did not take those lessons up with him now because of what we said at the top of the show. Just uh, it, it's an economic certainty, as we've seen in Detroit, as we've seen in San Bernardino, if you year after year are spending more money to keep an enterprise going than you're taking in, and you're running up hundreds of millions of dollars of debt, which the city has now with its unfunded post-employment liabilities, pensions, health care costs for the retirees, when when the mayor, current mayor took office, that liability was $334 million. It's only gone up in three years. And cities that have not addressed this by making tough choices instead of playing politics ended up in receivership. Maybe, the, maybe that's the best thing that could happen to the city because then you start from a, a blank piece of paper. But didn't we have, we've had experience at that. Weren't we in receivership at one time, not it, too long ago? It wasn't, it wasn't receivership. The state had to come in with an oversight board. We didn't go bankrupt. Okay. That hasn't happened. We have not seen that. And the, the city got out of it, but again, you know, there are diminishing resources. Population, Chuck, it's not, this city is not getting younger. Well... Th th this is a, a, a major concern. The city is not getting younger. The population, of course, is, is declining. And, um, and, and it would appear, based on the lack of, uh, of, of industrial jobs that's being created here, is that the personnel that's moving in are, are not coming in to be productive to work in, uh, in, in industry. That's right. And uh, that that's, has to be a major concern. You have service-type jobs that, that is correct. Uh, waiting on tables, uh, tending bar, turning down beds in hotel rooms, that's right. putting butter on popcorn at the movie theater. <laughs> Not, nothing wrong with those jobs. We need those jobs, that's but, right. But if that's all you have, you, your, your city is going to start catering to tourists and second homeowners. What works in Stockbridge does not work in Pittsfield. You need, as you said, the industrial jobs. And I, I believe those jobs are, can be found. It hasn't happened. Well, I, I, I do too, Dan, because look, we, we have a lot going for us. Uh, and, and we have uh, a, a, a great amount here that could, we can use for, for, for salesmanship. And so far, we just have not been able to put that together. Well, we have, we've not we haven't taken, been able to do it. And we've not taken the city out yeah. on the road. One idea I had was to do get a professional road show together and hit the conventions, hit the business meetings, 
and and have that in your budget and go out and and literally try to sell the city and get an influx of interest and at least try to do something rather than what is happening now which is a constriction tax base is getting smaller people are having a hard time making ends meet and the current crime wave I'm calling it a crime wave because that's what it is baffling two nights ago we had this on the planet there were at least four businesses broken into on Wakona Street and you, you hear about North Street well-known businesses being uh, burglarized multiple times something's not happening that should be happening well, that, that's a, a scary scenario in, in, uh, in, in, w in what you're describing and we also see it on a on a daily basis yeah you stroll know, down North newspaper. Street this is and and uh, you'll and you'll see it happening be before our eyes uh -huh. and no one uh, Chuck you would be the you know, with all of your experience, you'd be the last one to suggest easy changes and it's going to happen overnight. But it, it's got to start somewhere. And in my view, it has not started at all in these past three years, two plus years. Mm -hmm. It certainly doesn't appear so, Dan. Uh, but something has to happen. We can't continue going along blindly thinking and saying everything is all right and there's not a major problem here. Yep. Because there is a major problem. Well, and we're not going to solve that now. And, and I have fulfilled a career ambition, Chuck, and I did f talk radio f daily for 14 years and never had you on a show. And we've, we've met many times off the air, and mm -hmm. I fulfilled an ambition. It was kind of like you tackling Jimmy Brown, I guess, because uh, I, I would still remember your name being talked about. I was just a wee lad growing up in Pittsfield, but with a, a great interest in baseball. And uh, you know, were one of those, you were one of those names and came back and made your living and your life here in town. Well, was, was, was able to do that. I, I don't, uh, I would imagine it's a little, little more difficult uh, at, at this time. Well, well it is. To, I'm to do, uh, you know, to do that. I'm just going to jump in here, Chuck, and, okay. and uh, present this gift to the show. This is a piece of, uh, of uh, ribbon that has not been actually cut by the mayor for, uh, in one of his ribbon cuttings. And this, this is our, uh, <laughs> the empty suit memorial ribbon that we want to present to you for being on the show and being such a great guest. Thank, thank you very much, Dan. So, Chuck, we'll just uh, you. ease you off, and uh, and we'll wrap up here in uh, our three minutes and change, and uh, let's get the empty suit theme music. I don't know if, you, if I can hear this again or not, but uh, let's give it a shot. Let's get them out of here anyways. I'm off this set. Next time, tuck your shirt in and bring your coat. Keep it going. about some applause for Chuck Garibaldus. It's <laughs> left uh, third Thursday. Uh, I would advise uh, those who have partaken to get off the streets before sundown. You want to make it home safely. And we hope there's not another teenage riot at the end of uh, the event tonight, as uh, has been known to happen. And, folks, thanks for joining us here. We'll be back tomorrow on the planet, www.planetvalenti.com. And we'll, we'll just leave you with this thought. We made a reference to the crime wave. And if you've been reading The Planet lately, it's, it's been referring to the and North Street merchants are in a panic. It's their livelihood. They don't know what to do. 
we broke the story of the mayor having a secret crime summit. He was there, the police chief was there, and others, including some prominent names who we won't mention from the business community. And the mayor actually made a jaw-dropping statement from a source that would have reason to know that he thought that these this rash of break-ins, it's probably more than 20 at this point, the police have not said, were caused by one man, the <laughs> one man, Tom. And we're going to go out and try to catch Tom tonight. Because the mayor says if we catch this guy, it will all stop. It will all be over, the crime wave. Now that's either brilliant or pretty darn naive and sign of someone who is not reading. We've got less than a minute left. Folks, again, thanks for joining us. We enjoyed our time with you. We enjoyed our time with Chuck Garavaltis. And we hope to have you back here again next week where we'll, we will be uh, once again presenting the show. We, we got some, uh, maybe we'll have some more of the Generalissimo. We've got another character cooking. And on behalf of our great crew and Chuck Garavaltis and the empty suit, thanks for nothing. This is Dan Valenti saying so long, everybody. See you on the upside. Mm -hmm.